This is Dust War Journals, your number one stop for all news and discussion related to Dust 1947. My name is Johannes, and with me today, as usual, are my lovely co-hosts. Hello, everybody. This is the new parental guidance, Luda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had some feedback that uh, I, I think one, one of our listeners called it your colorful metaphors were a bit yeah, too much. Yeah, there's a <laughs> Goron problem with that guy, I tell you. <laughs> And Magnus is also here as usual. But as not very usual is uh, our other guests today. And I want to welcome to the studio today our lovely guests. Uh, first off, we have Mr. Olivier from the studio. Welcome, welcome. And of course, the man, the myth, the legend himself. It's not true, I'm not here. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, 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 the ghost of Paolo Parente. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you thank very much you. for being here. It's been uh, it's been a long time since you've been on the show before since uh, since last year. Uh, I think for you, Paolo and yeah, uh, yeah, Oliver. Well, I think Oliver you you were on. Uh, you kind of ne- mess kind of nestled your way into uh, that discussion as well when uh, as when Ludo was yeah. uh, back in uh, in Warsaw last yeah, year. It was a wonderful time for me. I was uh, it's, it's one of my best uh, times in dust uh, the dust community. I, all that time. I'm alone with Paolo and uh, Olivier, and they were telling me all the crazy <laughs> stuff. Well, you, know. you, no, s- you squeezed every bit of information from them that you could. Yeah, well, I tried, but I, I could squeeze those two for months, for days, <laughs> if I was allowed. So, so my first question for Paolo and Olivier has to be: How hard does Lada squeeze? <laughs> No, he's, he's, he's very polite uh, when when he squeezes you out. No, thank you. Your information. Yeah, yeah, yeah so of course. Thank you. It's hard, but it's it's out of love, so that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, we're basically here to talk uh, a little bit about the Dust Nordic tournament, which is Was one that? of the reasons that uh, you were here. <laughs> yeah, I think people have seen uh, a lot of stuff from it on if they, especially on the, if they're on Facebook, there's been a lot of buzz about it, and I think we should talk at least a little bit about the presentation, Paolo, that you did and some of the news that you announced that are coming. But I'm really glad I I showed the real. To the community, yeah. the response is very positive. Yeah, it's I I was scared and nervous. You can imagine. I mean, the real. I mean, I think I've designed them like seven times and decided so many different recipes for them. And uh, this is the final one, the one I really want, the one that was the first of my choices. To go for the pulp filling that matches perfectly with our dust figurines. And, uh, well, the response is so positive that I'm really, really happy. Uh, it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, just responses like, oh, finally, I've been waiting 10 years for this. I'm almost in tears yeah, and too. stuff like that. It's just, yeah. <laughs> so it's fantastic to see that it's mm. moving. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about the tournament itself also. Um, there was a, quite a bit uh, a turnout. We were at one point actually at full capacity, but some people had to bow out uh, last minute, unfortunately. So, but uh, it, at the finals, it was won by our good friend and colleague, uh, fellow Viking, uh, Laser Roger, or la- mm. like he's called now, Ninja Ro- Roger. Ninja Roger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The tide of ninjas. Yeah, the tide of ninjas, exactly. He brought uh, an army with 10 <laughs> ninja squads in it. So. Yeah. But with flowers on the base. Yes, yes, of course. So lovely. Very lovely. And his own custom mm. 3D printed tokens. And oh. yeah, he gone all out for that army. So really, mm. really cool. It was an awesome weekend, I have to say. Yeah, this, uh, it's the, um, definitely the tournament on the planet with the most beautiful tables. It was like sure. that. It's like that every year. So that's, that's uh, really, really impressive every time. The tournament was very interesting. I don't think I saw two identical armies. Yeah. Every oh. block was played. Every faction was played. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you could see the whole range of miniatures that we have on the table. So that was very cool. I really like what you did. Um, very uh, the all the tables and I, and I hope people can find the, the pictures on the on the internet. All the tables have a lot of character. It's all unique tables, and the scenario adapts to the table every time, and it's a brilliant way of doing things. When you have these beautiful uh, scenery buildings and tables, it's a perfect way to do it. And um, yeah, that was a lovely time. 
Lovely time. Another thing that was very cool is about the scenery. When the scenery didn't really match the existing scenery for the dust, then there was, uh, there was a sheet of paper explaining the special rules for each scenery element yeah. that was very well organized, very professional, if I may say, and make it easy for the gamers to understand what we're dealing with without and avoiding discussion, without discussions. It's a wonderful job. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. And as and as usual, I would, I would add something to that because it's interesting. Um, the miniature gaming, by definition, is an infinite number of tables. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's impossible to, to plan rules for every configuration that sure. every gaming group on the planet is going to encounter. So I advise you, as I do every time I can, to create your own rules, to create your own scenarios, your own terrain rules, using uh, the guidelines that we can that we can offer. But, I mean, on these tables, you had Derek's and <laughs> V1, V1 rocket uh, pads. I mean, yeah, these need specific rules for from the community that, that plays on this table. And this is not something that I... I can imagine doing for... Yeah, we kind of beforehand, we just printed those and, and taped them right on the table because most players will not be playing on that exact board, for example, with the with the uh, B1 rocket. So only the players who actually plays on that table needs to know the exact rules. That was the idea. So we just taped them straight there. Yeah, perfect job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very elegant solution. Mm. And I definitely agree with you, Oliver, that one of the, the main reasons why you want to play a miniatures game is to express your creativity in different ways. And this is definitely one of the things that uh, we've taken to heart to, to really make sure that every game is unique. Every game is something new. Yeah, it is there's something else other than perfect tournament balance. Another thing I would like to add is that <clears throat> no matter how intricate the scenery was, every table played on a grid. Yeah. So yeah. this uh, this myth that mm. uh, some players uh, sometimes discuss with me about uh, uh, playing gridless because otherwise they cannot use their scenery, well just proved wrong during this <laughs> weekend, very wrong. And that, that's one of the things that we kind of wish we could do is bring our tables to players all over the world mm. in, in a more practical way, mm. <laughs> other than just showing pictures and maybe short videos, just to bring them to, to the people over in Singapore or in the US and uh, just to show what you can actually do on the grid. Yeah, but even mm. these only are very inspiring. I mean, yeah. it's just, just to show them, say... Yeah, people. Pe- the community was inspired. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I hope you so. Gave a very good signal yeah. to the yeah. community. And just talking about uh, the rest of the world, Paolo, you've been kind of a whirlwind tour <laughs> right the last yeah. few weeks, I think. Yeah. yeah, I've been so lucky to have to attend some events in uh, in the states, and then came over Europe and new, more events. Das Nordic was my last one, but yeah, I've been attending Gamma in Nevada, then uh, a few dust days here and there, one in Atlanta, one in Toledo, um, and then uh, Adepticon, which is my favorite convention ever. And yeah, it's been it's been tough on my body, uh, I must say, but yeah, I'm really course. exhausted, but I'm also happy because, again, keeping in touch with the community in person is is important to me as well as maybe the community, because uh, it gives me the pulse of uh, what is the feeling around our game. And, mm. uh, you know, the community is growing nicely and steadily, and uh, it's always a blessing to be able to, to meet the guys. Yeah, And absolutely. play with them sometimes. And, and gals. These guys, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are, and uh, there, you, you see that when you look at uh, the different pictures from all over the world, from different events. That's there. Of course, there's a lot of guys playing, but there also, they're starting to get a lot of women. They're starting to get a lot of kids playing, uh, which is really cool. Um, that's we saw that just this weekend, uh, Luda, with uh, with your daughter actually. Yeah, well, I had my daughter with me, and uh, everyone who has been to the convention has heard. Uh, 
two thousand times. I like to just point out it was not my dice that were weighted; it was her. Because every time I rolled to try to hit, I drew blanks and shields. But when, as soon as she picked up the same dice and started rolling, she was like producing nine out of ten hits and stuff like that. It was ludicrous. Fortunately for my opponents, uh, she faced in and out still she's only she hasn't turned eight yet so she lost interest a little bit and then she came back into it and she was like i had to sugarcoat her a little bit to <laughs> to play all the games but she were there all the games she said she had a huge fun uh she loves the mercs as i've said a couple of times <laughs> the, the ladies and she just wants to play them every time and loves when they beat the beat the boys and uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. just give her a couple of years and she will be like a master commander of dust yeah i hope so it, I, I would be so proud a parent if i would uh, to see her win the uh, european championship in 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 two years or something like that <laughs> that's the goal we have we have a lot of ladies who play the mercenaries these mm, days. Yeah. it's nice that's very good yeah. Yeah. And just uh, off topic, hanging on to something that Paolo said, I actually want to give a little bit of credit also to Magnus for another thing. Yeah. Since uh, when we started with our Gothenburg events with the Dust, uh, we named them, or you named them, the Dust Days. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anyone calling them the Dust Days before that. And now people all over the world are calling their tournament Dust Days. In number. So I'm just, I might be rubbing your ego the wrong way or it might not be true i don't know i'm not sure if if ours was really the first I, going by that i name. can't remember i you know. wouldn't i think the first one is 2012 or something okay. I, don't, I don't want to i, don't I want remember to be. they been named by a guy from argentina ah. who used to play dust in the okay. very er early days mm -hmm. um unfortunately I forgot the name but uh -oh. yeah he, he, he yeah, sure. Ignacio, yeah. Ignacio. No, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, that's the first time I heard that day, and then mm. he got he got it. Okay. Us. Yeah, yeah, but what we can then, say is that on our first event we had it, we had six people playing. Yeah, that's another thing. Then yeah, that's a big more event. <laughs> now, now there's a few more guys. Yeah. So I've seen this question come up sometimes like, how do you do it? You just keep going, keep yeah. doing what you do, and it will grow. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. That's that's just the way. Have perseverance. That's yeah. uh, that's how we do it. Absolutely. Or in our case, in your face attitude. I mean, <laughs> just keep that. <at> <laughs> yeah, we we all contribute with different factors. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, before this uh, this show, we kind of asked around uh, the community also because uh, we know that we, we would have you guys here. So we asked uh, around to get some questions for Paolo and Olivier. So let's just dive in, I think. We have a lot of questions from oh, all I have no the world. answers, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Um, one question that's actually come from a lot of people, they want to know more about uh, the history of the game itself. You told uh, a bit about this uh, last time we had you on the show, but stuff like where does the actual name Dust come from and uh, how did you develop the, the story and the setting for the game? You have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so then, well, wow. That started as a personal project, uh, combining my love for model kits since my childhood. I, I used to build uh, World War II 135 scale model kits. Um, World War II was uh, very present in my life uh, for many reasons. My father fought in it. Uh, uh, all his generation was uh, really involved in the in the war. So, I grew up in a, in a in a family where everybody had thought. Uh, all his uh, friends were were involved directly on the on the field. Um, they kept talking about uh, things and they had, uh, you know, great stories. My father was decorated Medal of Honor. So mm. he was a medic and he was a decorated mm. Medal of Honor. Um, so, yeah, you know, all the people he saved and stuff, that, were, that, that was my childhood. Plus, of course, I really enjoyed building other kids. When I grew up, I learned how to draw and um, I started developing this project, the great idea I had. I uh, was uh, mixing science fiction with World War II. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to meet uh, our boss, my business partner, William Yao, who decided to invest on the project. And uh, when finally we were able to make it a figuring game, then 
Olivier came uh, came in and uh, and uh, we made it happen. Yeah. We've been lucky and unlucky, of course. So the the universe, I started it, and then uh, Olivier has been developing since he came on board. So ten years ago, mm. all the cool stuff. Uh, that is had been adding made the universe richer and more interesting, and of course we have a good use of his talent, I would say, and yeah, we love it. Oh, very cool. And another question that's also come from several uh, people that's kind of related to this: How do you see the future of the game developing, like both uh, the Release and models and stuff like that, but also like the story. How will it progress? Yeah, uh, many from the, long gone plans. From the very beginning, I think we, t- we 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 talked about that we wanted this ca- this game and this universe to be alive yeah. and moving forward. So so the, the our oldest players have seen the timeline evolve already, and they're going to, you're going to see the timeline evolve more and more and more and more, which doesn't. I mean, we can still have battling our own past uh, in the next expansion Paradise Lost you'll see there's a small campaign there's a, a lot of campaigns but there's a small campaign that happens a few months before the timeline yeah. it's a battle in in Rome and uh, as you may have seen on the new map of the world um, the Axis has conquered the Italian uh, territory Except from Sicily, but these battles happen during the Battle for Rome, so we can always go back to the past to tell stories. But the main universe will continue to move forward, and uh, we have a lot of plans for our universe. It's not going to be static. It's not going to be static for long. Just jumping in there, I have to ask though: Did they capture Italy or liberate Italy? Uh, the way I see it is liberated. Yeah, I thought you would. The way yeah. I see it is captured. Yeah. But both are correct. Both are correct, of okay. course. <laughs> but, you know, now there's a gigantic, gigantic mythos monster in the center of Rome. So nobody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> they have other problems to deal with. The poor Romans. <laughs> no, no, but just, I don't know... We're going to move to the 60s someday, but do, should yeah. we say that? I don't know. Well, we don't know yet in which in which way we will move the timeline so far. There are plans. There, there, there is a timeline written, and we have, uh, we have uh, milestones that we are reaching, and, uh, and then we, we're going to move on from them. Um, but yeah, I think it's too soon to, to unveil the whole, the, whole, the whole thing. But we're in the 40s now. We'll be in the 60s in 20 years. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> of course. So, but but definitely time, now, so, this, yeah. the, the, the world of dust is not... It's not static. It's not mm-hmm. static. It's, 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 it's evolving. And things are happening. You see, you saw, I mean, the event of the mythos rising on the planet is huge and they, we have a lot of more stuff coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And But do you see that we, in a few years' time, perhaps we'll be playing like that other game, you know, in two, two timelines at the same time, perhaps? Some people are playing like 47 and some are playing, say, 68 or... No, 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 no because it's, it's, you can go back in time for one scenario. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. But everything, as usual, from the start, we've made everything compatible with everything else. Ah, good, good. So you can, you can play a storyline scenario, let's say, uh, a major, major battle, or you can play, mix and match everything you want, as usual. Mm. We've mm. always done that. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's awesome. Uh, so let's go to some more specific questions. Uh, we have, for instance, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the Vril, of course. And one of the questions we got from uh, Will Patterson, are the Vrils going to have flying sources of any kind, like aircraft or something like that? The Vril army, uh, it's actually a vanguard of the, of the major Vril army, uh, comes uh, to Earth uh, with uh, anti-grav vehicles. They are looking like they're flying. They're mostly anti-grav. Um, some, seen from far, uh, will look like a flying saucer. Mm-hmm. You know, when they come towards you, that silhouette will remind you of a flying saucer. And then when you have the model in your hands, you will see it's 
is more than that. I personally love flying saucers. It's not a problem with uh, with them. It's just uh, I don't want to limit the shapes and designs to to a circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. But the silhouette seen from far, and when you will see the first pictures of those, you will you will kind of see flying saucers. For yeah. Sure. Nice. And that that's kind of emblematic, I think, about uh, the design of the dust models in a way, because it's something that at first glance looks familiar. But mm. once you go and cl look closer, it's something you haven't seen before. Mm. Um, I feel like that with a lot of the models, actually. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Joshua Orrington asks, one of the fun things about Dust 1947 is that each faction has a particular weapon flavor. For example, the Germans have the lasers and the Japanese have the rail guns and so on. Uh, and what about the rails? What kind of uh, army flavor or special weapons uh, could we see for them? You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. So that's no, no, uh, <laughs> no, I can expand a bit. Um, the the technology the human technology that that we have in the world now is you have to consider that it's old real tech yeah so basically we can tell a bit about this story yeah, that's the why they come with flyers and and anti grav because the walkers to, for the real today are old technology hmm. but but basically the, the 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 starship that crashed and that was found by the Germans is is a small repair craft sent to repair uh, like a radio real radio station it's not a real battleship full of the new cool stuff mm -hmm. and it's all tech for them mm -hmm. and it crashed a long time ago exactly it was found. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so since then the real have evolved considerably they don't have walkers they don't have these, these all this is gone for them for a long long time so that's why you, you'll see that I don't want to give up too much, but it, of oh, course they have okay. energy, super I, I, powerful energy weapons. I call yeah. them antimatter weapons, and I think that should be enough. Yeah, and mm. and they have yeah they, they have a lot of other cool technology. Yeah, we just have to wait and see exactly yeah. what they do. So yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, and if you don't want to expand on it right now, I just like to add though that the way you describe the weapon on Nordic. I feel that was very super fun way, so I sincerely hope you can manage that I way. I hope that so. Olivier and yeah. his group of playtesters will yeah. come up with a very good solution about that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. it would be super. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Aaron Black asks, now that the real might be making their long-awaited appearance soon, are there any plans for a global campaign in which like tournament games played physically worldwide could be used? to redefine the current territories that each faction controls and how that could change the world map this of the game. This is already going on with our yeah. online campaign. Yeah, in a way. Uh, yeah. The results of the last year campaign, I mean, gave uh, shape to the last uh, edition of the map. And yeah, of mm. course, this mm. is why we have the uh, online campaign. <gasps> Please contribute to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, that actually brings us neatly into the next question from Gauthier Forno. How much does the battle reports we submit actually change the story? <laughs> oh, how much? Oh, that's difficult. Oh. Well, there, there, there were there, territories that were really influenced by it. And uh, uh, I've heard recently that we should add some territories, especially in Northern Europe, like Alexa suggested. But uh, uh, now, how much? It's, it's too old information. I don't remember. But yeah, there was there was a serious influence of the results. Yeah, nice. They, yes, but but they modify the map. But they, I can we can no, we also cannot completely modify it every time. It's, no, of course. Uh, I, I mean. If you look at France, how they moved during World War Two, there was not there were not major swings weeks to weeks or months to months. Though, so, but no, no, every bat rep is taken into account for mm -hmm. sure. But things move slowly in the world of dust on the front. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I I just think that uh, people kind of get that because it feels like stuff is happening quickly, more quickly than they're used to, at least. Uh, for the latest few releases, there's been like going from January. We've been on January '47 <laughs> quite a long time. Sure. Then we moved to the summer, and now we're in September. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, but you you have to remember in January '1947, this is 
the Axis throws at the planet everything they have. Yeah. Everything mm. they have. That's the that's the start of dust. Yeah. So that's why it's it but it takes some time to move. But now they're losing traction. It's been six months and the others haven't stayed passive. But they the Axis tried and failed, we can say failed, to take over the world in one fell swoop. But oh, there's still a major, major, major power to be reckoned with. Absolutely. For sure. Um, that actually brings us uh, neatly into a, a question from Oliver Galka. Why did you decide to break the IJN from the Axis? It, uh, like, I like that they are a different block. Uh, it's always nice to have something new. But being able to use the Japanese in a German army would be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> so. I think, can I answer? I think the mm-hmm. storyline is much better this way. It tells an interesting story about the pride of a people who are really pri- proud yeah. and uh, matches perfectly their, their culture or perfectly the best way we could. And uh, I wouldn't go back on that decision. I think uh, the Japanese deserves to be their own block. Mm-hmm. And we still have the, uh, the Japanese army, which is a part of the Axis still. Absolutely. So we might see some units from them for, in the future. For now. Yeah, for <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, teaser, oh, teaser. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things open. But the, but the emperor of Japan was never going to stay. Obey orders from a admi- German admiral? That mm. doesn't make sense. Mm. This thing was not meant to last. No, no. Yeah, because he's one of the uh, he's a bigger God. leader that is still alive, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, not to say too much. There. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, uh, but that cat is out of the bag now, isn't it? Or yeah, I think it? so. Huh? It's, it's been it's been a while. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to you, you cut it out if it's it was if it was too much, you know. No, no, that's fine. I'm good. All right, so let's go to something completely different. Uh, Brian Yoon's kind of a <laughs> contributor who regularly shows up and gives us very interesting questions. I'm, fi- I'm an official fan of Brian. Yeah, we uh, all are. <laughs> and he asks, Paolo, years ago you mentioned a new allied two-legged walker that you called the bear. Yeah, I yeah. remember that. Can you give us any details on what that was supposed to be? Um... A heavy version of a two-legged uh, walker, heavier than the Mickey and the Mickey chassis, uh, capable of uh, using heavier and bigger turrets and heavier and bigger armament, uh, occupying a square, using a bigger base that we already tooled uh, that is uh, 93 millimeters in diameter, like exactly matching our squares. Mm. So it's an ongoing project. Uh, I really want to do it, uh, and uh, I have a lot of sketches of it, but no designs, no 3D. That's, otherwise, I would have proudly shown it in, during my presentation. Next year, for sure, we will have designs. Yeah. Then we will finally have bears in the game. Yeah, yeah. we'll be the only one. We, we will have to bear with you on that one, I guess, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's talking about that. There are a few mm. other older designs that mm. haven't shown up as playable units. Like yeah. uh, one, for instance, that I've always talked about is the Gunther, mm. the small mm. kind of mobile suit like thing for the Axis. No, the Gunther is no smaller. At all, right? no. Well, it's smaller than the the other Axis walkers. If you compare, like the, a human to it, there's the Gunther is uh, is as big as a Konigsluter, hmm. just vertical. Oh right, hmm. yeah. Just is is a big is a big boy. Hmm. Um, I don't like the design anymore, hmm? okay. and I like the Konigsluter better and the Jagluter and the Jagluter better, and uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, we have better designs now. I don't want to go back. Like yeah. uh, some other old designs, like were like just tanks on legs. Uh, I regret that. Like I, I, I don't really like the Mickey for that. Even if it's a very popular model <sighs> and people love it, uh, I still think that is the weakest design I have in the line. <laughs> oh, you yes, made so much from, from, from a design point of view, I mean, then <laughs> I mean, you, you like it, I, I'm happy. You know? Yeah, well, that's one of but, the reasons why I got into dust. I bought the coffin box just for the Mickey. So, oh, sorry. Well, well, and, that, that's all good. But yeah, <laughs> tanks on legs uh, with uh, diesel punk, uh, 
Mm. Mm, I okay. mean, we can do better than that. We will do better than that. And we'll keep doing better. That's, that's the goal. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, uh, but yeah. on the topic of uh, new units, uh, Johnny Grogan asked, will there ever be civilian models uh, in the game, like the old uh, Operation Frostbite style from 8043? So, like, neutral models or something like that? I have a wish. Olivier says no, and I understand why he's saying no. I have a wish of uh, developing one day uh, groups of resistance. But that's not mm-hmm. that's not civilians. Oh, but there are <laughs> civilians that take up they no, take no. weapons and they go mm-hmm. fight. But, yeah. but it's not these are not, not different things. You mm-hmm. said civilians and then neutral and then resistance. It's three different things. Okay. Mm-hmm. The only thing that I plan to do that looks a bit like a civilian is resistance. Yeah. Oh, that I agree yeah. with. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that could be cool. No, no, there's no civilians. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no civilians. No, civilians yeah. have fled the, the battlefield of dust. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. What would be mm. the purpose of civilians in the game? I don't understand the question really. Uh, what, what, what would be the purpose of a cow? Yeah. <laughs> On the yeah. Food. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Food. 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 Well, now we have aliens and mythos creatures. Are civilians food? Yes. Okay, fair enough. That's fair enough. Okay, okay. I give you that point. Yeah. That would actually be disturbing, but like a terrific rain with some fences and some humans inside and it's no, like no, no, no. No, no, no. let's not torture civilians no, no. I mean, no, no. we play no. with toy soldiers yeah, yeah it's okay but no no i mean fun. i mean resistance looking like bullseye for example yeah. this is perfectly yeah. fine this absolutely is perfectly fine. and uh, that's a that's a very good comparison because but that that's, is, yeah. so that's a soldier in civilian clothes that's yeah. not a civilian mm. no. yeah yeah but you can see the kind of design the visual design there Sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure. But uh, civilians... Uh, yeah, some of the mythos uh, uh, figurines from the <clears throat> command squad, for example, yeah. the medic, uh, they're in civilian clothes, totally civilian clothes. Some of the cultists as well, they're mm. in civilian clothes, mm. but they're not civilians. Right? Mm. Okay. That's so, true. So I don't know if he's meaning looking civilian or real being civilian. So yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Looking mm. civilian, yes. Yeah. But, can I just cut in with a question just because I'm, I just need to cut in. I haven't heard myself, myself talk or something. No, I'm sorry. You've been behaving so far. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm proud of you. Now it's, now it's over. Uh, just going back to the Mickey, though. Uh, one thing that was super fun, uh, totally illogical, but uh, still happened in the early days, was that you could jump the Mickeys. And nope. could, I, I know they won't jump again, but could we have... One some kind of uh, mech because you know I'm a battle mech fan from since I was like one year old or something like that. No, but <laughs> almost I want I want jumpable mechs. Is it possible in '68 at least or something? No, you're Good. not you're not rich rich enough to bribe me for this. <laughs> no, 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 no. But perhaps you you, you need a uh, I mean a kidney or something. Yeah, come on. Yeah, you, could, you could at least do kind of a, a platoon rule, like for the KV forty sevens airdrop. If you drop them onto another walker, yeah. they could take damage or something. Death like from that. above. Death no, from no, above. I forgot why the Mickey doesn't jump anymore. Yeah. Because I remove it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there a, a real reason or? Yeah, I hated it. Oh, because okay. I thought it was I, fun. Yeah. No, no, it's 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 it's, 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 it's a good picture. The poor guys inside bouncing their heads around. It's a forty tons vehicle. Of course, you can do it, but you want to do it. Yes, you cannot so jump. No, I know, I know. I know it does, it's if it logic. falls from a cliff, everybody's inside is dead. Yeah, yeah. and you're yeah. talking about uh, that. Just reminds me of this uh, and, just, uh, and, 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 about and, weird rules and stuff like that about j- jumping. There's a, there's an old uh, Swedish role playing game with the kind of s- s- typical fantasy stuff where you can get what they call hero points and these allow you to do specific like heroic actions sure. one of those actions is that you can uh, you can't be hurt if you fall off a uh, horseback the rules doesn't doesn't claim how far you have to fall. <laughs> you can fall from a horse down like a two hundred meter cliff, but you are a hero, so you don't take any damage. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I that's love that. that's that's the same bending of the rules that yeah. the guy who told me that. He can fire his mortar from a helicopter. Yeah, yeah I'm not interested. Well, let's not open this chapter because me, I'm against most of the things I see on the battlefield today. Yeah? Okay. Was, and and to answer the KV-47, uh, the weakest part of any 
uh, armored vehicle is the bottom. Yeah. Mm. So if a KV-47 falls on something that is as hard as itself, like another walker, for example, both are going to be destroyed. <laughs> now, it might be a valid tactic, but still <laughs> it's going to be forbidden in the game. <laughs> oh. Well, I'll start collecting money. And everyone out there, Patreons alike, you heard it first uh, here at the uh, Dust War Journals. Keep sending us money to get Olivier to change the rules for the Mickey. My, okay? my <laughs> price is balance. very affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, kind of tangentially related to the airdrop question, Bill Hegg asked, with how devastating airdrop actions can be for the opponent, are there any thought to re-examining the chance of success? At the moment, it's uh, two out of three to actually get the, the action. <laughs> Bill Hegg wiped me out in two turns during, <laughs> during Adeptico <laughs> with the Yeah, That's why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry it's, for me. It's, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, Maybe 66% is too much. Maybe a reroll, which yeah. gives us 55%, yeah. could be tried. 33% definitely not, mm. because then mm. airborne units basically completely disappear from the game in mm. a one fell swoop. We can try 55. Um, you can also play with special tournament rules and have a very foggy day where planes planes don't see their their target clearly yeah and they're 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 sorry in the foggy day they abort mission and they they, 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 exactly. they go back to the air there's no paratroopers <laughs> when there's no clear day so that might be um I don't know. Yeah, they, I know there are uh, instances where people have done stuff like that, that it's been heavy winds or stuff like sure. that. So, yeah, it's that's but maybe one way you can do, experiment with it. Let's see. Let's or see if, if we have a problem at 66%. Let's try that 55 someday. But so far, I'm pretty okay. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. All right. Uh, our next question comes from Mateusz Kuczynski. Uh, and he asks, uh, where do you take your inspiration from? Uh, we know that uh, you, uh, Paolo is a fan of John Carter. And we can see that with some of the brills. Uh, are there any other sources like this that uh, truly inspire you to create stuff for Dust? He kind of answered already. I mean, World War II and sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. In general, yeah. that's yeah. true. Yeah. Something specific. I mean, there's uh, specific comic books. Sure, uh, the but work of Koyo Koyama, a Japanese designer who oh. has his own line of model kits called the Machine and Krieger. Ah, yes. Mm. Um, I've been collecting his models uh, for like, I think, 35 years. Um, they were called SF3D at the time. They were published on Obi Japan, the magazine. Then he changed the name when he. He opened his own magazine, Model Graphics. Um, he's a monster and he's a genius. He, he was able to create these uh, World War II looking shapes uh, uh, and uh, mixing them with science fiction and still keeping World War II designs and weaponry. Uh, he was f for sure one of the main things that made me think about uh, doing dust the way it is. Even if my models don't really look like his, uh, besides maybe the um, uh, steel guards, who are, which are an homage to his, his work, in, a, in a, at least partially. Um, Hellboy, the comic book uh, with the presence of the Germans uh, at the beginning of the story, and some of the cool characters are there. It's been a ma big source of inspiration, of course. Yeah. I can kind of kind of guess that there's some there's some things that touch overlap yeah. there. Yeah. There was an old uh, costume for uh, for Sigrid that really was too inspired by mm -hmm. one of the uh, Hellboy female characters uh, to a point that he asked me to change the, the costume, which I did, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, can we, Johannes, put a link to the Japanese artist homepage in absolutely during, uh, on the homepage so we. People who want to learn more can just check out perhaps oh, some yeah. of that. There's yeah, a sure. very active group yeah. on Facebook about mm. uh, his work, and they publish models which are really well done. Mm. One, one guy is from Hong Kong, and he uses very, very uh, innovative uh, 
camouflage schemes. Mm. Uh, one of his works, and I acknowledge him on the on the group, was is inspired the new camouflage for our mercenaries with the pink and, oh. and light blue. Ooh. It actually comes from the work of this uh, of this guy in Hong Kong, who was a master modeler. Yeah. There is a lot of cool stuff to to yeah. see on that uh, Facebook page. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Called Ko Yokoyama. Yeah. Thank Very you. Cool. And so speaking about inspiration, something that I personally have been been wondering a little bit. Uh, besides your work on dust, uh, you probably are known, I think, uh, for most other people uh, as an illustrator for like card games and other stuff. Sure. So, uh, do you have any specific kind of uh, art uh, inspiration sources? I, I, I personally, I think I see. Um, some inspiration there from certain comic book artists and uh... oh, a lot of them, a lot mm. of them. I, I, I went through different phases uh, in my work. So uh, there was a moment, a lucky moment actually, that uh, Simon Beasley was the main inspiration for a bunch. Oh of yeah, I, I was actually just going to ask specifically about Simon Beasley because yeah. I, 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 I see some similarities sometimes. Yeah. I, I, yeah, there, it's not a secret. He was an inspiration for like uh, a whole generation of artists mm -hmm. of my age, and uh, there was a high request of the type of style in comic books uh, that, which gave me the opportunity to do the comic book for Mutant Chronicles, oh, for yes. example, mm -hmm. with, in which he could only do the covers, mm -hmm. and the interiors were done by me and other colleagues from Italy, mm -hmm. uh, kind of following that path. Uh, with our means, of course, and uh, at the same time, Magic was looking for the same style. So <coughs> they had Bliss from the UK, they have Greg Staples from the UK, they had Glenn Fabry, um, Alex Orley. There, there, there is a whole, I would say, a whole generation of artists that was really influenced by them. I, I moved away from that style uh, when I work on Dust. You will see it's completely different. It's mm -hmm. more like uh, my personal view. Of things and I don't. I no longer work in that other style anymore. Now, uh, I think <laughs> because that, my opinion and you know the way the you way I see things in my in my work. You uh, might do some belief. relapses and some from time to time, maybe. Uh, yeah, but yeah, no. I, I think it's correct. That I'm I'm away from that style, but it was a wonderful moment of of my career. I mean, I I had access to to many big publishers in, in the US and in Europe. I had I had the opportunity to do Just Dread, Slane, uh, Conan, I mean some Batman stuff, mm -hmm. Mutant Chronicles, which was very lucky for me mm -hmm. because that gave me access to Magic the Gathering and yeah. Um, yeah. And you got your name out there basically. But I mean there are mm. so many great artists out there. Yes. And I would say they are all a very big source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I recognize geniuses out there and I look at their works and I cry. <laughs> I cannot do yeah. the same. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a big world with full of inspiration. Yes, of course. Uh, talking a bit, little bit about design, so this question is for the both of you. Uh, Seth Squire says, of all the dust models, which are your favorite designs? That's a good question. None. <laughs> <laughs> they're all crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. No. Uh, but yeah. you want me to answer first? You think about it? Yeah, I know which think one. About I mean, it, but... To me, the most accomplished design I have in the line is the Yak Luther. Oh, yeah. The Yak Luther is very well balanced. Uh, um, the, sh the, 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 the very geometric shape... Uh, matches well with the with the design of the guns and the legs and the way it, it stands. I, I think that the it is still my best work design wise. Yeah. And so my favorite model. I kind of crazily love also the Japanese New Walkers though. Yeah, they're they're crazy amazing. <laughs> but for which I only designed the weapons because mm -hmm. the, the the body itself was designed by another artist, mm -hmm. um, Davide Fabri from Italy, uh, which has contributed a lot to dust in the in the beginning. Yeah. What about you, Olivero? I think it's the I, I agree with the young Luther for sure, but no, my favorite. It's the six-legged Allied Walker. 
with, mm. with the long term. Yeah. Yeah, because really enough, it's it makes a lot of sense uh, in a pure military way for me at yeah. least <laughs> because you have a crew that is fighting. You have a you're gonna have guys reloading. This this uh, this miniature is alive. Yeah, mm. it, it's it's living, and you have a guy in the front, and you have guys manning the machine guns, yeah, looking I, for I planes, agree. and and. So this is alive, and you can mm. customize it as much as you want. You can give it as much or as little as little life as you want. You can stack uh, uh, artillery shells behind it because they've been firing all day. And uh, I really, really, really like these. Uh, these, these, these. That's my favorite. But this whole, this whole line of models, I really, really, really love them. Mm. But how about a version two of the long tom with a double blast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe. Yes, maybe. Absolutely. We'll Absolutely. See, we'll there's, a, there's a yeah, but this no, this I don't want the, to say. The, the, walk, <laughs> the walking priest. We saw something. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's this. Yeah. This this is going to be the time to revisit, revisit some stuff. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Nice. But of so, but yeah, I agree that the long tom needs a little bit of help. Absolutely. So. Uh, Joshua Hash, Hatch asks, uh, kind of related to that, are there any specific plans to go back and revisit and maybe re sculpt some of the older models uh, in the range? Like, similar to how Rosie uh, got her n- a new model recently. <laughs> Honestly, uh, we time all of them. All of them. I have plans to um, redesign and re- remold uh, the uh, heavy infantry for the Allies. And make it in our plastic mm-hmm. because it's feasible and uh, it it will be very 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 nice much nicer than now uh, but of course with time and the resources um, we are clearly looking into rescold uh, all the all the old references because our our figurines today look much much better yeah, the, mm-hmm. there is a big difference between you can if you just look at the rosy models, the old one and the new one besides each other. Mm-hmm. That's it's a big not, difference. That's mm-hmm. normal. Yeah. That's true. Of that's course, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely normal. Yeah. the technology is better today. Uh, the three D sculpting uh, has changed a lot of stuff. Well, the three D sculpting allows you to give the correct size to a figurine because you decide it <laughs> instead of <laughs> just getting a party figurine that is the size it is, and you know and. Uh, well, we also found the better sculptors, and yeah, and that the molding techniques have, have evolved. So yeah, uh, I don't regret any of our figurines. I mean, no. I, I I love them, but I can say that some of the old uh, allies, especially, are kind of weaker than uh, than the rest of the line. So they will be the first I would like to sculpt, mm-hmm. both heavy troops and. Uh, Class two troops. Yeah, mm. I think that's something that people will really like, mm. <laughs> yeah, because people have been wanting to uh, to get a refresh of that for a long time. I think. So Class two. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The Allied two in non winter uh, attire yeah. would be really, really nice. So, yeah. like, or some. And version. always, always remember that we have seen these miniatures for longer than you. Yeah, mm. that's true. Yeah, of course. So nobody wants to change us <laughs> more than <laughs> us. <laughs> it's true. Right? It's, it's true. true. It's. But on the topic of Rosie as well, I just have to ask you now that I have the chance, uh, Paolo, you talked somewhat about uh, if perhaps she's getting a squad with bazookas or something like that uh, if you, uh, way back. or this She's anymore. getting a squad of mechanics who go fight and repair things with, the, with her. Oh, when can we... Do, is there a timeline to that or is it... This year, for sure, in resin. It's oh. exclusive to our website. Uh, and uh, as soon as possible in in plastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great news. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, it feels silly because I have pictures of that and I forgot to put it in. The <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you don't have to show others; just show us, you know. <laughs> uh, and I think I, I made the corn. Yeah, yeah it's, everything is ready. Oh, cool, 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 cool. Good. Actually, it's, actually, those are being manufactured now. Mm. So. By the summer, they should be out. Mm. Uh, 
Nice. Yeah. So talking a bit about uh, older models and new cards and uh, stuff like that. Ben Langen, uh, our old friend from from the US. Hello, Ben. Hello. Uh, Hello. He's asking, are there any plans to release new updated faction decks and rebalancing the the point values of the units? No. (laughs) Short and simple. No, 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 no. I don't think... Ah... Basically, I don't want to rebalance things that Until haven't been resculpted, and and yeah, of course. But which is ben, not going to happen tomorrow? Ben, mm. send me a list of things you need, you think needs to be rebalanced, <laughs> because I don't think there are that many. There's a couple, maybe <laughs> at most. But that's but that's the thing with balance. Everyone has different opinions, people, mm-hmm. yeah, depending yeah. on how their local meta looks. Mm. So no, no. and now uh, it needs a lot of convincing to convince me to sh- change something. Mm. Uh, we changed the platoon very recently, thanks to one of the Vikings. He said, you have a laser... You have a Blue Croix Grenadier Platoon that has no laser command squad. Yeah. Mm. And I said, you're absolutely right. So we changed yeah. it. Mm. And these are changes that are absolutely fine and we, we need to implement them as soon as possible. But uh, they are... I mean, I just I just played Mythos this weekend and I had my ass kicked by Rangers. <laughs> so what what exactly needs rebalancing? <laughs> That's so true. That's That's true. So so uh, the guy had hot dogs and pounders and he just just destroyed me. Yeah. He had bazookas and and so uh, yeah, it, it's it. I'm I'm open to any suggestion, but be very convincing. <laughs> Uh, may I suggest just a small wording on the ranger, heavy ranger platoon, though, that their but their um, super <coughs> saves should be active until turn they move in turn two, instead of just dropping in the beginning of turn yeah, two. Yeah, like with the uh, PT forty seven, uh, the camouflage. Yeah, because uh, they are the only one now that there. drops their cover on the start of the turn. Yeah. Perhaps this is too specific, but I'm sorry. No, no, no. This is an interesting question because maybe uh, in the future, in a future version of the rules, we will have a, a phase at the end of a turn or the phase at the beginning of a turn where we mm. remove all counters and stuff like that. Or mm. Because because this is a bit complicated mm-hmm. at the moment in the game and I don't really like it. Uh, effects that carry on from one turn to another are always complex in any game. Mm. And those that and at the beginning of the turn, or at the beginning of the activation, or uh, I don't like all that. So okay. this will be normalized, uh, I think, for every unit. Ah, okay. I, 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 will, I, will, I will try to do something like that in the future, mm. for sure. Because at the moment, everybody's kind of lost. Mm. And it's complicated, <laughs> so I don't like that. Good. Very well. Um, Emil Persson, one of our fellow Vikings, uh, asks uh, that uh, Mark from War Factory is going to arrange a tournament in which all the players will get a free uh, Paolo model, or rather, it's Tito. <laughs> it's Tito. So, yes, but uh, his his question is: Will this model be possible to get only on that event, or will there be other opportunities? There are models uh, who are previewed for events because we think that uh, people who travel uh, a long way and attend an event which is official deserves a little reward but it's a preview Uh, that's it Uh, it's given so it will be a free model for a few events during the year until Das Nordic next year, maybe it will be too late because everybody will have it already. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Maybe we'll arrange something different for next year in Das Nordic. This year they are stickers, so okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it will be released uh, normally in the line of uh, what we call Dust Collection, so the, the resin line exclusive to our website. Mm. And uh, it will be released actually quite soon together with a group of lady mechanics that you've seen during the presentation yeah. now it's all over the internet yeah. 
Um, and of course, there's a plan of doing the same thing in plastic as soon as possible. Very cool. But it's not me. It just looks a bit like <laughs> the belly is too small. He's, he's too. He's too. Uh, he doesn't do you justice. They could have beefed him up a little bit and put some muscles and stuff like that. Because yeah, he has more muscle than me. By no, far. No, 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 no. I think it's. I'm an old hunchback. He's straight to his back. Yeah. Because uh, I, I think you said that before that the. Uh, the kind of goal is that all these preview models uh, are just that they're previews on stuff yeah. that will be I think there's the, there was kind of one thing that we have to um, wait a bit longer for the Kaori, the uh, sniper um, lady or oh, Kaori yeah yeah. because something happened with the mold it was something um, yeah we, we need to, to work on it uh, again so Kaori will not be in plastic for you mean in plastic right yes yes exactly yeah, yeah. we need to wait a bit more yeah. all right the weapon of kaori needs to be made in hard plastic and now we don't have a hard plastic mold available mm. which has been tooled now so as long as soon as i have one then i will put the weapon in there and then it will happen awesome yeah. uh, jeff mckeon has uh, a question each for uh, for you guys. So for Paolo, he asks, what color is VK so I can paint it correctly on my terrain? Mm-hmm. You need to download the novel about Zvergrad written by Andy Chambers. Mm-hmm. There is a chapter at the end of the novel called uh, The VK and You, mm-hmm. and it explains everything. There is, uh, anyway, before refinement, uh, VK is in two components. One is kind of dark and one is kind of light. Then you can see it bluish and reddish or whatever, but it's it's very well explained by Andy Chambers in the chapter. The whole novel is worth of reading. Oh yes, definitely. And on on that topic, isn't that supposed to be more, or is Andy now occupied with I'm other stuff? I'm begging Andy to yeah. write more, uh, and he says yes, but then he doesn't start. <laughs> uh, I promise. I, gi- I, I tell him I I pay you in advance. Just do it. Mm. But yeah. Uh, He's busy. He's very busy. Okay. Um, well, well, we, a lot of us who read it uh, wants a second one, and we hope and we pray. And, and we he like... wants to. He wants to do it. Oh, he good. Wants to do good. It. He's good. Just is just being very busy. No, of course, yeah, of course. Of course. I can um, understand. Yeah. And Jeff's uh, question for Oliver: uh, Are there any plans to release any other games in the Dust universe, like, for instance, epic scale games or board games, RPGs, card games, stuff like that? Yes. Short and sweet, as always. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and about other scales, no, really. No. Even if I... We, we discussed this also, I mean... Um, I love, I love... Sorry, I love, I love epic scales. It's my favorite scale for wargaming. Mm. But it makes awful miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is something I can add there. Uh, going back to our evolving timeline... Uh, Olivia and I have been discussing about uh, how would we play Dust 1963 when it goes, humanity goes to space and start, uh, you know, uh, traveling in our solar system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came up with the idea of making it in a small scale, a smaller scale. But this is so far in the future. I mean, don't expect mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. us releasing a small scale game next year or in the next few years because it's it's for the future. But the idea would be uh, instead of uh, forcing everybody to buy big armies uh, for the new era, maybe it would be cool to have a smaller scale. So keep 47 as 47 with all the vanities and then a different game for a different era. That, I think that's that's a good. That thing. that's might be a very good uh, kind of compromise to separate yes. the two games more. I, I like that idea. That's, that's mm-hmm. all you idea. So we'll yeah we'll see what happens then. It's but but, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I love I love uh, games in smaller scales. Mm. I love them and uh, and now I think we can make cool small miniatures. Oh, we're, we're capable of that. Which for the longest time was not <laughs> not true at all. No. The structure need to be different than yeah. our walkers. They will be too fragile in a smaller scale. Mm. There are too many empty spaces yeah. in our in our units, especially the vehicles. Mm. No, you have to dis- you can't just shrink down the designs, you have no, to make completely no, new designs no, from no, scratch. No. Yeah. 
you know, that these doesn't so for 63 work. would be perfect yeah so talking a bit about uh, upcoming releases James Swartout is uh, asking any word on the release for X33 the concept art is super interesting and I'm curious as of the overall size of this monstrosity yeah <laughs> how big is it <laughs> uh, around 15 millimeters mm. and uh, we need to be patient the scouting is not started yet so, so, so it's just it's a con- it's concept art at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, and I want to. Yes. Make it. I want it to happen. But on that topic, though, you talked a little bit about uh, Blue Blood Cross uh, being it's their year now. Yeah. Uh, but could you expand uh, both of you, please, uh, a little bit if what we can expect perhaps more from Blood Cross in, during this uh, year? Can we see? More models or more platoons? More what? What? What can we? Is there more for the blue blue Blood players to expect this year? The first thing I want to do is to release the set with Sigrid and the Ape Heroes, yeah, which mm-hmm. are now only available in resin. Yeah, please. They deserve to be plastic and available to everyone. Mm. Um, we are talking with Oliver about uh, heavy armor apes, <laughs> a, a bit in the way like Gregor looks. Um, but not traitor. Not traitor. <laughs> not traitor. No, no, enough traitors, please. <laughs> and um, but yeah, it's in development. So exactly these dates, I cannot. I cannot give. Oh, okay. All but. right. And talking about size of uh, miniatures, Robert Lowry asks: Given that we're now getting two huge Titanic figures, namely the Avatar of Cthulhu and the Japanese robot, the Steel Samurai. Uh, are there any plans to l- release such huge figures for every block? But they have it already. <laughs> the, the SSUs have huge, super heavy tanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the uh, uh, Königsvotan is gigantic. Yeah. Volume wise, they're very mm-hmm. similar. It's yeah, just, I think, I think it's, the height. it's the height that people are reacting to. So the, these are two are vertical. The others are horizontal. But mm-hmm. volume wise and 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 uh, size wise, they they will be very similar. I mm-hmm. think. So no, because they already have it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think you also that you you said in your presentation that uh, the tooling and stuff for these uh, big units uh, it's just a lot of work basically. Yeah, a lot of work and a lot of molds, mm. so, a lot of resources. Yeah, mm. uh, they, they we consider these big pieces like we did with the Konigs Lothar and uh, Luther etc. A, a marketing investment. Because there, there is no way to make your money back with the tools, but still gives a look to our battlefields that oh, yeah. other games in the same genre will never have, mm-hmm. and so we do it. Yeah, but yeah, that's it. Speaking about the uh, the Conex Wotan, Eric LeBlanc uh, is asking when can we access players expect to see this unit released? Uh, that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> that's my fault. Um, again, the, he participates to the um, improvement of the Blutkreuz faction. Um, the design is done. I need to fix something because you remember maybe I did one laser barrel longer than the other instead mm-hmm. of m- switching the guns in a way that look uh, one is forward with respect to the other uh, I still have to do it uh, and then it's an easy mold uh, so I think the tooling will happen before the end of the year and the model will be released next year Ooh, nice, very cool, cool. so a completely different uh, type of question Brian Bookstrucker is asking will there ever be Canadians in the game? Hello, Brian. <laughs> no, I love Brian. He's a super cool guy. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, yes, yes. I'd love to. Yes. Let's 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 say something else. Also, uh, we will raise heads with the British helmets. Yeah. For that will be adaptable to the Desert Scorpion bodies. Uh, the uniform as a scorpion also matches perfectly the scor- the British uniform, which was used in Europe. Mm-hmm. So, switching the heads and um, coloring the the uh, the uniforms in khaki will make uh, khaki drab, whatever the, yeah. the name of the the color is, 
uh, will make perfect British and Canadian troops. So oh, nice. Immediately. And we, we see people do this uh, a lot, that they personalize their armies yeah. and they go for for armies that really aren't represented rules-wise in the game. But uh, like, just for instance, now, uh, Dust Nordic, we actually have a, a spectator in the studio mm-hmm. today, uh, Lexa from Finland. Yeah. Uh, Hello. <laughs> so he, he actually won the most appreciated army award, and I think basically because of his conversion and painting work to make his uh, Axis army be a Finnish army. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, really, it was cool. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, these little differences in between the British and the Canadians, we can only do make them happen when we do the premium product. Mm. Mm. Otherwise, you know. Yeah, we can have a. Do yeah. we need to have a, a Canadian card? I don't think so. No. I mean, would it would be just the yeah, same card? There, there the are Canadian. a few vehicles that are super specific as well. Yeah, I mean, mm. in the yeah. Allied Army, most of it is a paint job. It's a different paint job. Okay. That's, and I know that's complicated, but. Yeah. But you you do you did uh, show the uh, some Italian vehicles on the in the presentation, but that yeah. was kind of an idea. It's, it's not really a, a sub faction, but kind of a splinter group, or however you want to to call it. The way the way I see it, and I think Oliver agrees with me in the end, is that uh, the Italians would be part of a faction that we call Minor Axis Allies. All oh, right, yeah. So the, which will include uh, the Finns, will will include. Uh, uh, Bulgarian, or Romanian, you know, all these other uh, minor allies of the Axis. It's uh, it's a good way, I think, to expand the range with interesting models. Uh, the Italian engineering in the world of uh, dust is uh, actually quite uh, good. So they develop very interesting walkers that we are, you have not seen yet, but I have there in my notebook. Mm. And uh, some weapons that you've seen already. But I, mm. and so I think, I think it's, it's interesting also to give variety to the troops and, uh, and the vehicles. But yeah, it's for the future. I mean, the Italian community really insists with me on <laughs> releasing the Italians tomorrow <laughs> I think uh, I think besides Miriano and his his fellow dusters from Italy I mean I know a guy in uh, in the US who already personalized like Lexa mm-hmm. his, his army his axis army is fully Italian mm-hmm. and then um, Michael Serafatti and then uh, uh, there is a guy a duster in Australia who was kind of doing the same but I really, I really doubt that the Italians are really something that our fellow dusters are waiting for, like, impatiently. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. One day you can. Yeah. But kind of related, and actually, if we go back to the thing you talked about, about resistance fighters, it's kind of related to that as well. Christoph asks, uh, what are your thoughts on partisans as a conceptual sub-faction within existing blocks? And that's kind of an uh, interesting idea, I think. Yeah, that's the idea. That's the idea. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, use them as auxiliary units uh, with the existing blocks, and then you know, resistance is a point of view. So you <laughs> you resist uh, from these guys or the other guys. I mean, there is always a good reason to resist. <laughs> Everybody else, right? So. Yeah. But resistance is futile. Remember that. <laughs> In the world of dust, it's at least complicated. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, talking about uh, different nationalities and people all around the world, uh, Daniel Wernicke is asking, uh, could you give us sort of an overview on which continents or which countries there are big dust player numbers? Like, just an estimate, at least. Oh, you know the this... numbers at all. I have no idea of the numbers. No, but not enough for sure. No, <laughs> I, I, I can just tell you. I mean, it's a small sample rate, but I know from the people who at least go to our website to check out the the dust news, the big yes. If you go by numbers, it's uh, the United States sure. by far. Uh, when it comes to Europe, it's uh, it's Poland, Germany, Sweden. I think in that order. 
uh, and there are well, there are play people all over the world. Uh, Singapore is a big, uh, big place. Uh, Australia yeah. has quite a few players. The yeah, Philippines, so. we have this crazy crew of fifteen guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, but I mean the the big markets are U.S., U.K., France, Germany, Italy, Spain. I mean, it's uh, and of course the rest of Europe. It's it's. Uh, yeah, it's where people. It's where miniature gaming has been present for the longest time. <coughs> of so course, of course, it's yeah. it's uh, it relates. I think to for it. every company, the US is the number one market when you, it comes to figurines. Mm. Yes, of course, but that's basically true for everything, just because of the population and uh, and sort of uh, free market capitalism kind of stuff there. So yeah, it's just yeah, and it's I mean, uh, US is easy compared yeah. to Europe. There's one currency, one language. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's easy to. Travel. It's a continent, but still, it's it's uh, now it is yeah. It's way easier <laughs> to 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 grow there, I think. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know. And we, we that's not my part of the job. No, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> but we definitely see that the uh, the US player numbers are growing and quite rapidly. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Our Alicia and Gregoire are doing a splendid job in this regard. Yes, so, absolutely. You know, they promote the game mm-hmm. in a very correct way and towards the correct audience yeah. uh, I'm very really thankful so, yeah, yeah. But kind of related to that getting new players in the game uh, Michael Allen Hardin is asking what advice do you have for running a league or a club for Dust if there isn't a local store that carries the product oh, it's just just do demo games just ask the, the local store if you can do demo games yeah, so that that's definitely a part of it, and I think yeah, that's uh, it's the best. Yeah, uh, it's the best because the the game is so easy and friendly to demo, and it's I don't know it's it's my game, so of course I'm gonna be a bit partial <laughs> there. But it's so easy to demo, and and it it hooks people so quickly because the basic mechanics are so simple. So you can you can demo to kids, you can demo to people who have no idea what a miniature miniature game is. So just, sure. just, just if you can demo at the local store, I don't see how this is not gonna take off. Hmm. Honestly, I mean, it's, especially it's, on new on new players. Yeah, all the all the war gamers will be more reluctant because they invest a lot in other figurines and uh, they really don't see the intelligence of playing with the squares. But uh, once do, they try the game, do. once yeah. they open their mind and try the game, they 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 see the advantages. I I've, I've, I've heard these comments myself at Adepticon from very old gamers like me. I said, "Oh, actually, this is the first time we didn't discuss line of sight." <laughs> <laughs> oh, this game is really interesting in the end. Intact. Uh, the US does you say Patriots are doing yeah. a very good job in promoting the game, uh, and I must say every time there is. A volunteer who uh, starts prom- um, demoing the game in a store, then then the line gets into the store. Mm. If you if you're in the US, I mean yeah, the Patriots, and if you're in the Europe, the Dust Commandos. I mean these are uh, these these guy will help you to, but just yeah, just demo the game, mm. and uh, I mean I know it's it might be a. Yeah, but I agree. Like, like we talked about uh, at the start of the show, perseverance. Because uh, we we discussed this before on the show. Like, yeah. if you do demos, the game basically sells itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, I think so. We expect a eighty player tournament, a European Championship in Warsaw this year. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. now there was I don't know twelve or fifteen of us the first year. Yeah, you're gonna be eighty this year. So yeah, just just go at it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just watching Warsaw grow is just so fabulous because yeah. we were the lucky ones who were there the first year, and then it, for every year it's a massive step forward. Mm. And it's uh, I, yeah. I, now we have problem. We're, we're gonna have problems to accommodate everybody. Yeah, which is <laughs> great. <laughs> it's a great problem. It's work. a great problem to have. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. we we actually saw the first uh, scenario for the oh. European uh, Championship mm-hmm. uh, just. Last week, I think. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and uh, they have six uh, radio towers on each table. 
which is very interesting if there are going to be like 80 players or whatever it's going to be because yeah. that's a whole lot of radio towers <laughs> yeah it's a huge set of radio towers and it's going to be massive but uh, and i so love it but i as i said to marek uh, when he was here with for nordic i can't decide if i love or hate the scenario but I love it because it's different. I've never seen this scenario before. And yeah, I stole three it. I stole it for the next book. I love it so okay, much. Good, okay, good. I love it so much. It's such a brilliant yeah. scenario. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. That, that everybody's going to play it. In, in, it's going to be in Paradise Lost. Mm-hmm. I'm going to change it a bit, but it's going to be in Paradise Lost. I haven't read it yet. No, it's, uh, it's, it, it's another good, solid reason to go to war. So if it's not for Tito, it's not for everything else and all the prices and stuff that we know Marek will supply. But also this scenario now, it's just wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Talking about scenarios, um, Mattis Breyer asked, I really love the four Babylon scenarios. Is it planned to publish more like those or any scenarios for multiplayer games? Oh, that's... Yeah, okay. I must have hit the spot on this one because everybody keeps asking me about... Uh, yes, yes, of course we'll do more. Mm. Uh, I These were never popular and now everybody's talking to me about it, them. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's it's a bit late for the next... For Paradise Lost. It's a bit, bit late because... But I'm going to see what I... What I can do, and definitely I heard you. Uh, there are many more of you that play three and four player scenarios than I expected. Mm. I just wanted to have a couple just to have a little fun. And then everybody said, oh, they're great. Okay. So, so yeah, there will be more, but uh, I don't know. Maybe for, for Paradise Lost, maybe. But for later, for sure. Okay, very cool. And believe it or not, we are now at our final question for this episode. And this question comes from Sean McDonald. Sean asks, are there any units that you regret adding to the game? And if so, why? (laughs) Oh, that's a difficult question. So if Uh, it's for balance reasons or if it's something that doesn't work thematically? Yeah, definitely in the past. Yes, definitely in the past. There were uh, were units that were way overpowered and really unbalance the game mm. absolutely at the moment I don't think so um, we have a few units that are very powerful on small mats on so small battlefields sorry mm. when you put them on bigger battlefields they become meh. Mm. but yeah definitely uh, the previous version of Panzer Prince was something that I hope I never see on a dust uh, gaming <laughs> table ever again. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... Uh, but 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 otherwise no. Yeah, like, that was ob- ubiquitous basically. If you played the Axis, then mm-hmm. yeah, and that which is a problem. Hmm. But then it became such a big problem that it became mandatory to play Axis, mm-hmm. pure and simple. Mm. So, which is, uh, no, this is this was really bad, but do I regret? Huh, no, not really, hmm. not really. I mean, uh, I know bunkers with weapons in them might seem weird. <laughs> they're not meant for tournaments. They're no. meant to have fun games. Yeah, okay, in some <laughs> things like that, maybe, but other than that, no, I don't regret anything. Mm. Absolutely not. Well, the game has a life also outside tournaments, so... Oh, yeah. Of course. And um, that's that's one of the things that I think that we uh, we on the show uh, kind of have to think about as well. We talk a lot about tournaments. We are tournament players. And we talk a lot about balance. We talk about point scales and stuff like that. But um, even if we talk about, oh, that unit is bad, that unit is not worth playing, that's from a very strict competitive tournament perspective. Sure, sure. That doesn't mean that the unit is worthless. Far from it. You can make every unit in the game work for you if you want to. Absolutely. That's one of the strengths. There is nothing that is worthless, I feel. Definitely and, not. And if you assault a beach from the sea and you don't have landing craft, you won't make it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you play a beach assault scenario and you don't have any way to cross the sea, <laughs> your units will drown. So <laughs> there's no 
there's no almost no point for me pu putting an army point cost on these units. Mm -hmm. If you don't have them, guess what? The guys won't go say, now nah, we're gonna swim this one. It'll be <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's like it's like putting it's like putting army points on the on the planes that carry paratroopers. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Mm. No. Of course there has no planes. So no. guess what? Yeah. The guys are not jumping. Mm. So so the I think bunker mm. the bunker we wanted to put army points because okay, but it's a scenery piece. It's something that you assault and it's a tough mission and okay. But but it doesn't need to be yeah, playable and, on every tournament battlefield no, I, on the planet. I, I see Definitely that. not. Yeah. And, and you can still have a super trooper like I had in this tournament, like Tina and Diana. And you can have Greg's uh, head in the hyena's mouth for two turns and not use the execute and then lose the game because you, for some reason, for two turns, just don't execute the fucker. And you only have one left. So oh, the F word. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, there's uh, your one per episode. Okay, sorry. Yeah, there's one per episode. <laughs> no, no. no, but, but good, I mean, just, good effort. I mean, yeah. I'm really proud of you. On this yeah. one. <laughs> I did it just for you, Oli. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Learn your troops, guys. Learn your troops and yes. gals. But then it's easier to win. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, as a kind of final thought, do, do uh, you guys, Paolo and Olivia, do you have anything uh, finally you want to say to our final listeners out there? Oh, I'm too shy. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, thank you for playing the game. Uh, no, just no. I want. I have a message for you. Thank you for making this awesome podcast. And then mm -hmm. it's it takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, and and uh, we wouldn't do it <laughs> so thank you guys thank you all three for doing it um, and it's thanks, awesome yeah. to listen to it uh -huh. and I put it on when I paint and I'm happy <laughs> to listen to you I will be so much more happy in the future when there won't be any swear words <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and thank you all for playing Dust yeah as a, a thank you for creating Dust for us to play I have to say so <laughs> that's ours <laughs> but no, I think you are you are it's it's like the the kind of working relationship that we have we all contribute with our different parts but it's not basically it's not always the parts that make the whole great it's the combination of them I wish so much Paolo would contribute the part which is his head <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and also, uh, as always, a big, big thank you to everyone out there for staying with us, for listening to this podcast and uh, supporting us, supporting the show and supporting the game. So thank you a lot from me, Johannes. And from me, Magnus. And of course, from your big pal and huggable Luda. And Paolo. And Oliver. And thank as you. always, we will see you on the battlefield. <laughs> oh, wow. I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Dust War Journals. You can find us at dustwarjournals.com or on social media at Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Dust War Journals. And you can find our Patreon page at patreon.com slash dustwarjournals. All music used in this podcast is made by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com.